<laughs> well, hello. Uh, it is 2019 as I record this. And this is just a very short intro uh, to the podcast, uh, which is to apologise, really. I, re- I originally recorded this podcast pre-Christmas, thinking it would be festive, and it turned out to be anything but what it turned out to be was somewhat cold-ridden. And while I managed to do the recording before my cold really kicked in, and it was a proper grim one, um, is that uh, I didn't have the energy, or frankly, I couldn't hear particularly well to do the mix down. So this is a pre-Christmas podcast being delivered post-New Year. I hope you've had a lovely festive season, and here's to a very successful and happy 2019. Well, it's back to basics for me in this podcast. It's just me and a microphone and a fairly cold studio. Uh, It's quiet up here. It's my last day uh, before we head down to spend uh, Christmas for a few days with family, which is always exciting. You'll have to forgive the fact I can hear it in my headphones. Uh, I've got a slightly husky voice. Yes, I've managed to go down with some sort of uh, Christmas lurgy. Nothing major, but it is affecting my voice. Uh, So it's a slightly husky uh, podcast. It's just me sitting here musing on one of the things that has caused me more insecurity than, frankly, anything else, which is listening to the wrong people and believing the wrong things. Now, obviously, I'm fully aware, (laughs) fully aware of any kind of podcast that says, be careful what advice you um, believe. And because I'm essentially advising people not to listen to too much advice. Hmm. Well, there you go. There's an irony for you. Uh, but you really do need to decide for yourself whether this is one of those podcasts you should ignore. Uh, feel free. You know, it doesn't particularly worry me. I mean, it's nice to think uh, that you think I'm making sense. Uh, certainly, hopefully, the stories will be familiar to you. But before we get into it, uh, a quick update. It's been a few weeks since uh, the last podcast, and so quite a lot has happened. Um I've done 21 shoots, uh, mostly portraits, but a couple of hearing dogs thrown in, uh, and uh, the Royal Institution uh, Christmas Lectures, which I've done every year. Uh, So we do that. We go into London to the Royal Institution, uh, where the BBC are filming uh, the lectures, and I've done this for about eight years now. Uh, And it's a fantastic thing. I absolutely adore it. It's the most wonderful experience. Uh, I photograph uh, people talking about science. This year it's all about genetics um, and uh, evolution, and it's a phenomenally, phenomenally great programme. However, one funny story, this is a, a, a big, very famous theatre with about 400 children and parents and teachers in it, uh, and I managed to miss a couple of steps. Luckily, it was during the warm-up, it wasn't during live filming, uh, and I missed one step and crashed down <laughs> the other two right into the middle of the theatre. Um, I am literally, by the time I land, I've got a camera in my hand, I've got a waist pack on with all my lenses in it, and I'm lying flat on the floor, having dropped you know, about four or five feet, uh, to find the comp <laughs> looking down at me, uh, wondering what on earth has happened. Um, and, uh, of course, an audience of 400 kids thinking this is absolutely hilarious. And the only thing I could think of to do was to take a large bow. Because what else are you going to do? Uh, I did it in front of everybody. I crashed to the bottom. And um, I figured I've just got to own it. <laughs> what else could I do? Just own it. It's fine. Um, it was quite um, was quite amusing, apart from the fact that I managed to twist my knee uh, and an ankle in the process. So I managed to limp my way uh, through the rest of the shoot. Uh, on top of the 21 shoots, uh, 17 uh, different reveals, uh, which is really lovely at this time of year. Of course, you know, that's all revenue coming in in December. We're like every business. We need the revenue. Or more precisely, we need the margins, um, which is good. And I've had uh, three wedding pitches, all of which we've won, two for 2019, and one of which is for uh, 2020. So next year now is shaping up to be uh, quite a good year. I mean, a final note from us on this year's business is we've just broken all of our records, which is lovely. It's been a really nice year. The past few years, uh, we've worked flat out, um, and when there's lots of consolidation we've done, but we haven't really grown the business as well as much as I would like. I mean, a few pounds here and there. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that's not unsuccessful, uh, but uh, this year we've uh, smashed... Uh, through all of our records which is really really nice and we've done it on the whole without increasing the number of shoots so it it was uh, revenue targets 
that I was really pressing um, that uh, we wanted to get through and we have which is which is a nice nice way to sign out the year um, I'm hearing plenty of stories of people finding this a tricky year and it, I think it is going to be an interesting year for those of you listening in the US um, yes I know you're watching Brexit and wondering what on earth we're all going through um, my personal view is it's carnage and it's crazy uh, but that's you know not for this podcast there are plenty of other people talking about Brexit uh, so anyway, why did I decide to do a podcast all about advice and why you should be careful what you listen to? Well, I'm going to tell you some stories, um, all of them slightly different and all of them with different outcomes. Um, they're all about us and, or me and my experiences. I think when you get to a certain stage in the industry, people think you're immune. They think that you know, you've, you've climbed that ladder, you've gone through it all and they look at you with a degree of disbelief I think when you're saying no I find it hard you know if I hear the wrong things it gets me down uh, so here's some stories uh, about when I uh, came into the industry and when I sort of some stuff that's gone on th since then and some stuff that's happened fairly recently uh, the first of which is in 2009 so in 2008 I joined the Master Photographers Association the MPA um, and I got my licentiate in fact I won best licentiate of the year uh, which is, uh, you know, your starting qualification, but I was thrilled to bits. I never thought I was good enough to get a licentiate. Um, I was so insecure about it, I just assumed um, that I wasn't as as good as it was as was needed. Um, but I did, I got my licentiate and flew it, and I also won a handful of awards. I think I won uh, a Portrait Photographer of the Year Award and a, and a Family Portrait Photographer of the Year Award. I don't know what the titles were back then, but it was something along those lines. And had a pretty phenomenal year. And so in 2009, the subsequent year, the following year, um, I'm showing my mentor my work. Now, I've been really lucky. I have this incredible mentor. He's still my mentor, a guy called Kevin Wilson. If ever you need a really shrewd, sharp, intelligent guy um, to look over your images, he's the one. I don't um, aspire to be Kevin, but I've always loved the way he is, and he's always given me really solid advice. And I think that's where my love of good advice possibly started, uh, at least in the photography industry. Um, so in 2009, I'm cocksure of myself. I'm going to get my associate. I won best licensure. I'm still shooting the stuff I love. Why would I not get my associateship? So uh, at a training day, I took along my portfolio and showed him my images. And one by one, he went through those images and he was quiet. He didn't really say very much. And then as he got to the final image, he folded the thing, the folder back up. And he said, well, you've got one image in there that might do all right in a competition. But everything else, you've gone backwards. He said, you're not as good as you were last year. And I think that was the most, that was the, 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 the feedback I got that stung me the most in my entire career to date. Since then, it's been much easier to take that kind of, a, kind of feedback. But back then, that really, really hurt because I thought I was developing. And of course, just like a musician, and they, they talk about your... Um, difficult second album I'd gone through that you know I'd produced a really good body of work for my first panel my second panel um, I think I'd lost my way a little bit and Kevin you know was brutal but I didn't see that at the time what I saw was someone telling me I was no good and I drove the four hours back down to uh, the studio from where we'd been pretty much in tears to be honest thinking well that's that I'm giving it all up if I'm no good I'm not bothering um, I'll go and do something else I was a very successful consultant before this career let's go back to that and over the next couple of days the what he told me sunk in he didn't tell me I was no good he didn't tell me I couldn't do it in fact far from it he told me I could do it um, it's just that in that particular body of work I wasn't doing it so I turned all of that real disappointment and upset into a real drive to go forwards and I've held on to that story it's a really important story for me because sometimes you need to hear it I did need to hear it there's no doubt about that I didn't like hearing it but I'm lucky in the sense that I managed to find inside me the energy to make that a forwards looking conversation not a backwards looking conversation it was all about what I could do and what I was going to do I just hadn't done it yet and that's one of the stories another story is that every time a supplier comes here, I talk to a supplier, and we, you know, we talk to a lot of suppliers um, of frames, of albums, of product. They will always tell me, at least once, this is flying out of other studios. It's the best selling product in other studios. Now, for the first few times I heard that, wide eyed, I go, that's amazing. 
I'll have me one of them. Um, and I'd put it on the wall or I'd put it on our displays and it wouldn't sell. And this is quite common and it's really upsetting because you spent quite a lot of money on sample products. And in the end, it didn't sell. I've no idea. I'm, I'm not saying that the suppliers are lying to me, but they are the studios they're describing are not my studio. They want to sell product. Of course they do. And, you know, we're a pretty high-end studio, so most of them would like to sell product through our studio. We're not volume. We're not going to get them, you know, huge numbers because we only have one camera in this studio. But we're still a pretty cool studio to be around, and salesmen like to sell us stuff. But it always makes me feel insecure when it then didn't sell with us because what I would read into that situation, well, if this was selling for other people, we must be no good if it's not selling for me. And, of course, that's not true. It's just that I have a client base. I have a client base that doesn't necessarily resonate with all of the other studios out there. And then the next story is about all of the photographers I've met along the journey. And invariably, they tell me how I should be doing things differently. Now, we're a pretty good studio. We have a, you know, a good long track record, enough awards not to worry about awards, enough letters not to worry about letters, um, and enough really wonderful clients not to worry too much about things. But I still talk to lots of photographers and I still listen. And one particular photographer um, came in, he's a lovely photographer, he's a really good photographer, um, and proceeded to tell me why I should do it completely differently, because then I could have you know multiple cameras in the studio, it wouldn't just be me, and we could make a lot more money, and you know I should shoot fairies. I think he said I should turn over one of the studios and shoot fairies, you know, these kind of um, photoshopped backgrounds and fairy dust and stuff, and that's just not my style. It doesn't particularly excite me, it's not something I want to do, and it's not something that I want our studio to be known for, because the market we're in probably wouldn't have that as a key element. And, you know, he laughed and said, well, look, he said, look at the car I'm driving. And I looked at the car he's driving and yes, very nice car. But then I'd have to do something I didn't want to do. And I keep coming back to the same point in this particular business is that when I left my role working as a consultant, I earned far more money doing that than I do now. There's no question about that. Um, it's a well-paid job. I traveled all over the world. And I left because it wasn't about the money. It was about lifestyle. It was about what I wanted to do. And the reason I don't do these high volume tricks to try and get the um, huge amounts of revenue in is because that would just simply be going back to a world where, for me at least, it's it would turn into a job that I didn't want to do. And that was no different to being work, for me working as a consultant. And I gave that life up because I wanted to do something that I feel passionately about, that I love, that every day I crave creating pictures. I do not crave doing photoshopping on fairy backgrounds. I just want to create simple, elegant portraits every day. That's all I'm interested in. Um, I know that might not be the best business model in the world, but there's a trade-off here in that I could make more money by doing different things. But if I wanted to do that, I'd simply go back to being a consultant and double my salary overnight. And I don't want to do it because I love what I do. And that's why you know that kind of advice isn't particularly helpful. And on top of that, uh, you know, you, you, see, you read this kind of stuff on Facebook all the time. I, I read one this morning, I think. There's a uh, well-known photographer. This is a big US photographer saying that you should definitely do all your shoots for free because look at me. I'm a multimillionaire and I do all my shoots for free. And he's right. I mean, of course he is. But then you'll talk to other photographers, equally, equally, um, equal standing in the industry. He'll tell you you should shoot with a high shoot fee. There was one photographer in the UK very publicly um, changed her business model where she was ch charging entirely by the hour and selling frames at cost. But then I don't think that worked out. I'm pretty certain that didn't work out given what she's now doing. So you'll hear this advice. And in the end, all you can do is figure your way through it. Uh, another one that really upsets me, I get these. Um, every day I get a Facebook ad or two that's saying, Photographers, do you want a successful business? Do you want to know how it's done? Pay £30 a month and I'll give you all the answers. And then you dig into it and find it's a 20-something in New Zealand who has never, ever run a successful photography business. Though I've no doubt at all that they're amazing marketers, it's really hard to buy into that vision when they've never been here. They've never worked in this industry like we do. They've never walked this particular walk. And yet it gets me down. I, I think, oh, gosh, I wonder, you know, I must be doing it all wrong. The way they word it is, is I must be missing out. Why aren't I doing it? And it really, really, really upsets me. All of these stories really great with me. And why? Because like so many of us, I am fundamentally insecure. An awful lot of this just 
gets me down because I think I'm not good enough. It plays on my fears. It's the wrong way around. It doesn't make me aspire to be anything. It plays on my fears. A really good friend of mine, when I worked in the city, pointed out that Accenture, the company I happened to work for at that point, had one single recruitment policy, and that was to find and secure the employment of insecure overachievers. Insecure overachievers. Those his words, not mine, and he's right. And that pretty much sums me up. Insecure overachiever. And if I happen to listen to the wrong thing at the wrong time, it plays with my head. It's terrible. Um, if I catch someone saying, oh, I'm, I'm turning over £2,000 a shoot and I'm doing it, you know, with online sales. And I'm like, oh God, you know, I'm doing it all wrong again. And maybe I should change or maybe I should shoot my, maybe I should change my shooting style. Or maybe, I, maybe I should do more pre-consults or maybe I shouldn't do pre-consults or, you know, maybe, 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 and all it does is really screw with my head. Now, these days I am big enough and I'm experienced enough to know how to deal with most of those feelings. But even so, even the other day, I was chatting with a photographer and they were bragging about various bits of their business and their numbers were fantastic. They were much better than ours, higher average sales. But there was something about the story that didn't ring true. Now, Sarah, my wife, is brilliant at spotting this and she keeps me pretty grounded on it. But it still gets me down because those doubts enter my head. And there was one person I was talking to about um, averages. This is fairly early on in my career, and it illustrated the point really neatly. And she told me her numbers, and they were really good. I was really impressed. No, I wasn't impressed. I was jealous. I was jealous because my numbers weren't there. And we got chatting further and further, and I dug into it a little bit. And then suddenly, in the middle of this sentence, she said, well, of course, I'm not including the no cells." Now, a no, a no sell in that definition simply means a shoot and a, an ordering session where no money was made. The, the people who walk out, they don't buy anything. She said, I'm not including those. And when I dug into those numbers, you could halve their averages. You could halve them. And so ultimately, their averages were no better than mine. In fact, they were worse than mine. And I've taken a vow right from the very beginning of getting into this and starting to do things like seminars and I'm on stage and obviously with the podcast and Mastering Portrait Photography, I've taken this sort of view that I will always tell the truth as I see it. But even that, even that doesn't, A, necessarily mean it's factual, it's just the truth as I know it. And very occasionally Sarah will say, no, you haven't got those numbers quite right because she watches the numbers like a hawk. It's nearly always to do with numbers or awards or, you know, those kinds of things um, that you get asked, numbers of clients. Um, and she keeps me pretty much accurate. And I will always tell the truth as I see it because I think I owe it to other people not to make them feel like one or two people made me feel. I just feel really, really insecure and paranoid. And so there are a few problems with advice. There's a handful of things with advice. So this, in a sense, this whole podcast is technically sort of advice, or at least it's anecdotal and telling you some of the things I've noticed. Um, so in the end, I'm giving advice, telling you to ignore advice. But here we go. Uh, th there are a few problems with advice, one of which is it gets you down because generally, generally people, or certainly other photographers, um, are telling you how you should do it differently, how you should do it more like them, and by which they mean better, which, if you're like me, you take as a criticism. It means I'm not doing something right. Um, it also, number two, it confuses you because no one actually agrees what better is. There's no definition for better. Um, if you talk to five photographers, they'll all have the answer. It's just that they're five different answers. But if you look at it from their point of view, they're telling you what worked for them. And they're not usually, unless you're paying someone for proper advice, they're not usually telling you what's going to be better for you. They're simply, based on their experience, telling you what was better for them. Number three, generally, if you're insecure like I am, and not all photographers are insecure, there are some people out there listening to this going, well, I'm not insecure, I know I'm the most amazing photographer in the world. Ta, well, good for you. I'm really happy for you. That's not me. Because generally, when people tell you nice things, you don't believe it. And number four, when people tell you negative things, you do believe it. So you tend to bias your listening to advice. When people tell you where you're doing well, it'll zip through in a heartbeat. But when people tell you something negative, It'll really great. Now, this is also true. We, where I've noticed that is in here in our studio. If we have really good sales, so, you know, uh, in the reveal room or in the ordering process, we get a really good sale. We'll talk about that for possibly, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. And we'll be really elated and then back to it. If, on the other hand, we have a really poor sale or it doesn't go to plan, we'll spend the next week talking about that. 
Why am I talking? Why am I spending 90% of my time dwelling on something that represents a tiny proportion of our clients? Of course it happens. We have clients that in the end, they just wanted whatever it was, if they're if they came in on the back of a gift voucher that they had been given, they'll take the free whatever it was that was on the gift voucher um, and nothing else. And of course it happens. And of course it's disappointing. And then we spend ages dwelling on it. And that's the problem is generally when things go well, it zips past. But when things go badly, you'll dwell on it. And so things like family and friends, they will always say nice things. You should listen to them, but only because it makes you feel better. Because on the whole, unless you're like we do, we're very lucky and we have lots of business leaders in our friendship group. And I mean, really, you know, CFOs and the like. Um, and so they can be really useful to get objective advice. But they're also our friends. They're not going to hurt me. They're not going to tell me they see something wrong. Um, they're going to tell us the nice thing. So you should listen to them because it simply makes you feel good. With other photographers... They almost always exaggerate their own success because everybody wants to be seen as successful. We do. I'm doing it here. I'm sitting on a podcast. We're a really successful studio. and I'm not going to tell you anything otherwise. I'm never going to sit here and go, this has been a bloody awful month. We've had good months and we've had bad months. Like every business, we work them through and then we, you know, figure out how to make the next month better. But I'm not going to sit here and say, well, you know, I'm really down, partly because nobody wants to hear it and partly because it's important that our clients know we're a successful studio. And that is the truth of it. Um, so when you're listening to other photographers, always bear with the fact, always take into account that they're going to exaggerate their own success. Take it with a pinch of salt. And I'm really, really sorry if I'm upsetting anyone out there by saying this. There are just like us photographers, who's, photographers who really don't pull any punches, who don't inflate their figures, who will tell you real stories with real outcomes and aren't embarrassed to share stories of themselves falling into the middle of a theatre and being laughed at by 400 kids. You know, there are plenty of photographers out there, but you have to figure out who they are because there's an awful lot more who are going to exaggerate pretty much everything you tell them. And then there are the consultants and mentors. They're the people you should really listen to. The people whose job it is to understand your business, uh, your creativity and your goals, and to help make whatever it is you're trying to do possible. Now, I used to work as a consultant, for huge media companies. And most of my job was helping them understand their challenges and then help them find solutions. And invariably, the solution came from them. I was paid an awful lot of money to tell them what they already knew. It was just my job to help them figure that out and then facilitate it. And hence the old joke that uh, consultants take a lot of money for you to give him your watch and then they're going to tell you the time. And there's a huge amount of truth in that. But the process of doing it made that possible. Now, I'm a big fan of consultants. You might not be surprised by that. And we pay one here where uh, every month I spend time with them. They look at our business. They look at our numbers. They ask questions and I tell them the stories and they provide a couple of things. They hold up a mirror for me to see myself in an objective, as best as it can be, way. It's still based on their experience, but they work with a lot of studios, so I get access to data points. I get access to the industry in a factual way, and this is really, really important for me. It not, it's not for everybody, uh, but it works really well for me. Similarly, I have a mentor. I have Kevin Wilson, who's my mentor, and whenever I'm feeling a bit lost or I'm not quite sure where direction I want to go, I go and talk to him because he was the guy that told me I was going backwards. He's the guy I trust to tell me really tough messages, even if I don't necessarily want to hear them. I need to hear them. Now, on that note, be really careful if you're going to put your images in for critiques. All right. Now, we run a critique on our Mastering Portrait Photography website. It's a very gentle critique. And what I'm always trying to do is encourage because that's my role there. I'm not going to tear your images apart because I think, well, I know this, it destroys people. I know photographers who've had, their, myself included, have had their work absolutely slated by a name in the industry, but frankly, someone who I really shouldn't have bothered listening to. And there are plenty of people out there that will slate an image, and I'm not like that. That's just not my, I'm not wired that way, okay? Okay. But find critiques, find ways of getting feedback that suit you. Um, for me, when I've had really brutal feedback, it does nothing but drive me forwards. It's fine. I can deal with it. But if you're someone where that really rattles you, be careful of entering your images into critiques like that. Equally, I've had a request on our critiques to be a little bit more brutal. So we're going to try and see if we can find um, a way of being a little bit more, uh, providing a little bit more insight into 
some ways constructive criticism I suppose I'm going to try and do it in a very normal, a very um, encouraging way uh, but we are going to see what happens if we just turn it up a little bit but I'll still be one of those photographers who genuinely loves the fact that people are creating images and I love those images it might not necessarily be the most useful feedback if you're someone who thrives on it being a little bit more brutal uh, but I would hate to be that guy that destroyed someone's confidence so all in all this is I suppose a little bit of a rambling festive kind of podcast well it's festive in the sense that i'm recording it just before christmas uh, i don't think it's a necessarily a festive topic um and really is there a conclusion mm, not really it's not easy to say right this is the answer there isn't one because in the end if i gave you answer I gave you an answer as a piece of advice having told you don't listen to advice then you shouldn't listen to it anyway you have to gather enough information you have to have enough viewpoints and you really do have to have people um, people whose viewpoint is different to yours. That's really, really important. Don't just listen to people you agree with because they might not be right and all they're actually doing is providing an echo chamber to reinforce your own world view. You need to hear it from lots of different viewpoints. So triangulate. I love the term, triangulate. Find lots of different po data points and work your way through them. And then you need to figure out which ones resonate for you. Which ones feel right for you? Which ones, not necessarily you always agree with. So for instance, with Kevin, he's a phenomenal photographer and I have always loved his work, always. But I don't want to create his work. That doesn't interest me. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. But because of his insights, when he points stuff out in my images, by taking his viewpoint and either using it, because I think that's exactly what I needed to learn, or deliberately not doing it because I don't want my images to be necessarily clones of Kevin's then I'm getting the best out of that relationship and so it's a really interesting uh, dynamic and you need to go find those people go find um, the kind of feedback that you like whether it's deadline driven because you get real nice clarity or whether you want a brainstorm style where you each get to be really creative in your approach it doesn't really matter Go find those people and then figure out what you're going to do with it. But you must do something with it. Don't just sit on your hands. And if you listen to too much and think everybody else is right, you'll go nowhere because you go one direction and you go the other direction and you can't do that. You have to find a very singular view and then use that to work your way forward wherever it comes from. And each of us is different. So trust me on this. We all need advice and guidance at some point. Some, like me, well, we seek it regularly from people I completely trust. And I think some people are surprised at that, you know, given where we are and what we've managed to achieve in the industry. Um, you'd think, you know, possibly I didn't need to do that. But I heard a great story on the radio the other day from Leslie Garrett, who is a world-famous opera singer and really well into her career. She has sung everywhere and in everything and has a CBE from the Queen. So she's not a spring chicken. She's not new to the business. Um, and yet she admitted on radio that she has a singing lesson every week. She has a singing lesson every week. Genius. If it's good enough for her, it's definitely good enough for me. So I seek out advice whenever I can find it. I've learned how to ignore the bits that are not appropriate for me. I've learned how to cut through some of the bullshit and Sarah, my wife, helps me cut through the rest. And the best advice I ever had? Buy good shoes. So there you go. The final piece of advice, buy good shoes. And that piece of advice is irrefutable. If you've enjoyed this podcast, in spite of my slightly bluesy tone, please do subscribe. We are on various platforms, Podbean, Radio Public, Spotify, iTunes. Also, if you like it, please share it amongst your friends. We like to have the extra subscribers. Um, and leave us a review on iTunes if you wouldn't mind. It's great to get your feedback. Uh, also, if you have topics, ideas for topics, please do email them in. You can email me at paul at paulwilkinsonphotography.co.uk. That's paul at paulwilkinsonphotography.co.uk. Co.uk. If you are looking for any particular subject we've recorded previously, uh, best place to look is probably on the masteringportraitphotography.com website where there's an archive of all of my uh, previous podcasts. And so on that happy note, I leave you to go fill a skip with junk. That's what we're starting the new year with, a good old clear out. So until next time, remember, be kind to yourselves. Take care. <laughs>